Thank you, Greg. Uh, again, my name is David Gay. I work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and State Lab of Hygiene, which is a public health laboratory in Madison. And today I'm going to talk about the introduction of nitrogen deposition for agriculture, long-term measurements to support deposition and critical load assessments in the U.S. Uh, real quickly, my talk summary today, I'm going to talk about the sources of ammonia emissions to the atmosphere, where they're coming from. I'm going to talk a little bit about how ammonia is regulated uh, from a policy perspective, government perspective, and how it contributes to air quality issues particular deposition of nitrogen back to the surface. I'm going to talk about some measurements that we are showing over North America where we're getting a lot of deposition of ammonia down to the ground and that nitrogen, reduced nitrogen is now the major uh, deposition of nitrogen uh, to the U.S. And we're going to talk at the end about some impacts to the environment and responses that agriculture can uh, contribute. First of all, uh, we're going to look at it for a second from the environmental side of things, my direction, looking at ammonia from, as an air quality pollutant. Uh, so sources of ammonia to the atmosphere and atmospheric regulation. So overall, U.S. ammonia emissions are pretty much known to be coming primarily from agriculture. And that is primarily about 80 percent of all the ammonia that's emitted is coming from an agricultural source. If you break it up a little bit finer, about half of all the ammonia that goes in the atmosphere is from livestock manure. And about 33% is coming from the use of fertilizers in agriculture. It's a couple of other small pieces, basically wildfires and uh, summer urban emissions, but it's primarily from agriculture. And we think about somewhere between 2.8 and 3.2 teragrams of ammonia are moving into the atmosphere. And that's 10 to the 12 grams is what a teragram is. 80% of that is from agriculture. If you break it down a little bit further, the biggest sort of source profile is from the swine industry, followed very rapidly uh, or just as big from beef cattle. And right after that is dairy cattle. And then you move into chickens, broilers, and layers. But these are the big emission sources of nitrogen to the atmosphere. And I look at things from the atmosphere's perspective. And so how we track this ammonia problem is basically like this. Down at the surface, there are quite a few different ammonia sources. They're distributed highly over the states, as you all well know. Lots of agricultural sources putting lots of ammonia into the atmosphere over a wide range. And over the seasons, these emissions tend to come out in the spring. But all of that moves up into the atmosphere. And as an atmospheric scientist, the first thing that we need to start uh, worrying about is ammonia gas quite readily reacts with other pollutants in the atmosphere and forms solids. So immediately after emission in the atmosphere, we have both a ammonia gas burden, if you will, and ammonia that is now a solid after a reaction. And as you all know, once air pollution goes up in the atmosphere, uh, those chemicals start to be distributed as the wind blows them around, we call that transport, uh, if you will. And in the case of ammonia, again, gas and particulates, now we're worrying about, are moving out either short term on the order of tens of kilometers, but they can also move hundreds and even thousands of kilometers. So we have to track where these gases and particulates are going. Um, and I think as everyone also knows, what goes up must eventually come down and that ammonia in gaseous or particulate form is gonna come down either as dry deposition, uh, back down to the surface, settling out of the atmosphere just through gravitational pull of those particulates and those gases, or ammonia and particulate ammonia comes out of the atmosphere when it rains. I think you all have a good idea that after it rains, the atmosphere looks cleaner and it is because the pollutants to a large extent, get washed out of the atmosphere. And then this is the, this is the piece that my organization looks at, how much ammonia is coming out of the atmosphere just in rain. And so that's sort of how we see the issue from source to deposition. And our job is to particularly determine how much is coming out and where it's coming out. Um, air regulations relevant to ammonia. The first thing to notice that the 
Clean Air Acts and their amendments uh, don't actually directly re regulate ammonia. But as I mentioned previously, when ammonia goes in the atmosphere, it quickly forms particulate in most cases, and particulate matter in the atmosphere is regulated by the Clean Air Act. So ammonia is somewhat re regulated, but not directly. And then the depositional component uh, we'll talk a little bit about in, in a minute. So again, ammonia is not directly regulated, but it is because of the chemical reactions it goes through. Uh, the primary uh, air regulations in the U.S. are the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. These are the base building blocks of air quality and air pollutant regulation. They are in place to primarily protect human health. And again, they don't directly uh, regulate ammonia, but they, when ammonia forms particulate matter and really the small things, uh, the small solids, two and a half microns, uh, they form particulate matter and that is regulated by the primary uh, standards. And when uh, states are not in attainment for PM where they have high normal burdens of particulate matter, then uh, they are, the states are able to uh, also look at ammonia as a precursor for those issues. The secondary in AAQS protect public health and welfare, and that includes in ecosystem health. And as nitrogen comes down from the atmosphere, particularly reduced forms or ammonia, uh, they cause all sorts of ecosystem problems. Uh, many of you have seen uh, algal blooms happening in lakes and eutrophication that that problem drives. Uh, we are also quite worried about ammonia and nitrogen chasing, changing the species diversity in forests and national parks. And so that all fits into the secondary in AQS. And the third one is the regional haze rule. Aerosols in the atmosphere, aerosol is just a liquid solid mixture and the solids in the atmosphere can create poor visibility. Here's a picture, a very clean atmosphere and from the same place, a very hazy atmosphere. And you can tell the difference night and day if you will. And the regional haze rule uh, tries to regulate these sorts of loss of visibility and ammonia plays a big part in that. But again, ammonia itself is not directly um, uh, regulated. So that's sort of a quick introduction to emissions and regulation of ammonia. And now we're gonna get into the measurements of ammonia gas and ammonium in precipitation. I'm gonna talk quite a bit about our measurements with the NADP and something called CASNET, uh, which is another regional and rural air quality network that's running in the background. So again, I work for the National Atmospheric Deposition Program. We're a cooperative research project. Um, we are based at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, way down deep in our project, we're basically a USDA state ag experiment station cooperative that measures in five separate networks, the wet deposition of pollutants, i.e. pollution coming down in rainfall. We also do measure some gases concentrations. And among our five networks, we do that measurement at about 350 locations across North America. At this color-coded map is where we're doing our measurements. Now that includes obviously Canada and the US, a few measurements in Mexico, Bermuda, Taiwan, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Hawaii. Uh, and we've been doing this since 1978 and have about 600,000 precipitation samples uh, analyzed going back to 1978. So we've been doing this for quite a while and we can see trends as uh, pollutants change over time, the emissions of those pollutants change over time. And we also have an ammonia gaseous network where we have about 49,000 observations of ammonia gas concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, two networks in particular are, are of interest, the National Trends Network, where we measure the wet deposition of a lot of different compounds, including nitrate or oxidized nitrogen and ammonia reduced nitrogen at about 260 sites. And we do that on a week to week basis. That's a wet deposition measurement. And then there's our ammonia monitoring network where we have about 80 sites where we measure two week average concentrations of ammonia in the atmosphere. Um, if you look at some of our results from the ammonia 
monitoring network, our AMON, our gaseous, the annual, in 2022, the annual average concentration of ammonia is depicted on this map. And here's the color code from green to red, very low on the green side, relatively high on the red side. And if you look at all the green dots, typically in the east and well into the north, we have very low concentrations of ammonia in the atmosphere. But when you're thinking about agriculture, if you look right through the middle of the breadbasket of the U.S., the plains and the Midwest, the concentrations of ammonia on an average basis are extremely high. Uh, you also see that at agricultural valleys in the West and in California and in the uh, swine regions of North Carolina and the chicken regions in Delmarva. So we're seeing very high concentrations in the ammonia or in the agricultural areas of the U.S., exactly where we'd expect it. The CAS net network was an EPA network, the Clean Air Status and Trends Network. They measure a lot of different gases over about 100 sites in the U.S., and there are sort of, our, I call them, they're our first cousins. Uh, they do gas measurements to estimate dry deposition, uh, and they use our AMON values to do so a thing. And they also do a lot of modeling in the background. And here is their estimate of where ammonia dry deposition is occurring. And if you look back in the old days, 2000 to 2002, this is where they were estimating a lot of ammonia was being dry deposited or deposited without precipitation just due to gravitation. You see very high deposition in the central valleys of California. You also see relatively high in the Midwest and spots down into North Carolina and here and there. But if you compare this map to this one, this is 2018 to 2020, you can see all those emissions or dry deposition estimates really have gotten darker or higher or, or larger in their amount. They've broadened out into other valleys and particularly in the Midwest, a lot more areas are showing up with relatively high dry deposition of nitrogen. Again, exactly where you expect it, following where the agricultural activities are happening. Uh, NADP data shows the same reduction of nitrogen is now the major contributor of nitrogen down to the surface is ammonia. Um, back in 90 through 92, if you looked across the US where you see red on this map, most of the nitrogen coming down in wet and dry deposition was nitrate or oxidized nitrogen. And you see that was definitely the case all, at all locations east of the Mississippi and in the Intermountain regions. Only in the Great Plains where you see this blue, there was more nitrogen coming down as ammonium. If you look now or closer to now, 2010 through 2012, the entire map is basically blue, meaning most of the nitrogen coming down in wet and dry deposition is no longer nitrate or oxidized nitrogen. It's reduced nitrogen driven by ammonia. And so now the dominant player in nitrogen deposition is ammonia. And that gets directly back to uh, what we see in agriculture, where the emissions are coming from. If you look at ammonium wet deposition, so coming down in precipitation, this is a series of maps from the NADP. It's averaged over three years to sort of even out some of the bumpiness. But you, what you want to look for in this map is where the map is red. And that's where we see a lot of ammonia coming out in precipitation and in green where we see little. And this is basically just a time series starting back in 85, 86. The ammonia deposition issue was there, but it was relatively... Uh, are more benign than it is. But as we move in time, you see that red area getting larger and the red colors getting darker and darker, suggesting again that we're seeing more and more ammonium coming down in precipitation in the agricultural regions of the country. Uh, and that problem is getting worse. Exactly what we expect to find from uh, the ammonia emissions estimate. And this is 2019. We still have a a few more years to add, but the problem is much, much more significant now than it was when we started making those measurements. So we have a lot of nitrogen coming down. What does this mean? Well, in the environmental world, a lot of people look at things from a critical loads standpoint. 
A critical load is essentially a level of the atmospheric deposition below which no changes in the system occur. But once you get to a critical level and you exceed that much pollu pollution moving into an ecosystem, you begin to change the ecosystem itself. Again, low deposition, as deposition increases, you get to a point where you begin to start changing the system that you're evaluating. And the question is, are we there with ammonium deposition? Are we putting so much nitrogen into the ecosystems? Is it changing the ecosystems? And there are some maps um, that uh, estimates of critical loads. Um, again, this is a modeling exercise. And over here on the, on the left, uh, this is a critical load for nitrogen where the impact we are seeing is 5% decline in tree growth. Does that occur anywhere due to nitrogen coming down from deposition? And if you look at the blue areas, we don't think there's an issue with a critical load for nitrogen. But in yellow, we see this is an area where oxidized nitrogen coming in is changing the system and driving some tree growth decline. Uh, in orange, it's being exceeded by reduced nitrogen. And in red, it's being exceeded by both. And you can tell in this all throughout the Northeast, down into the Appalachians and well north into the uh, Midwest, we, those critical loads are being exceeded and at a number of points in the West. If you move over to the right, this is a critical load of nitrogen for a 5% decline in tree survival. Again, the same color code blue, we don't think that's occurring, but we do think it's occurring at certain number of spots along the Sierra and in the Northeast and basically the entire East Coast. Nitrogen, we think, is beginning to have an impact on tree survival itself. Uh, we see the same sorts of changes and critical loads being exceeded along the coastal waters. Uh, where you want to look is where it's orange and red, and that primarily seems to be happening in and around the Chesapeake Bay and the Delmarva Peninsula. At all these locations, we think critical loads for changing what's going on or driving eutrophic conditions, lack of oxygen, is happening. And you can also find these lakes and critical load maps available for a lot of other uh, critical load uh, points and for lakes and all sorts of different uh, activities. So my last section, uh, best management practices, and a lot, you're going to get a lot more of this in presentation number three, but I just want to do a quick uh, introduction to these. Um, the Congress and the USDA established national priorities for air quality, and maybe you're familiar with these sorts of things. Uh, they have defined emissions of airborne reactive nitrogen or ammonium, specifically listed as a concern by the NRCS. Uh, NRCS has conservation practice standards, specifically CPS 590, which covers nutrient management for cropland, decreased fertilizer applications, management practices to uh, have for nitrification inhibitors and slow release fertilizers and all sorts of other management practices that can be uh, brought into play. NRCS also has conservation practice standards for reducing ammonia among livestock operations. Uh, that include air filtration and scrubbing, feed management amendments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, also, the USDA currently administers incentive programs covering a broad range of environmental concerns. Uh, a specific one is the Environmental Quality and Incentives Program, or EQIP, uh, Part 1440 of that our federal regulation is the main working lands program that I think many of you deal with, uh, which has a potential to address ammonia uh, emissions. Um, payments to eligible farmers and ranchers for these investments and equipment and management practices is there. Uh, and it's all about mitigating air and water pollution or improvements to soils and wildlife conservation. Um, currently, there's about 1.2 billion dollars worth of funding out there that was obligated in 22, and that has been increasing with time. And Mahmoud's going to talk a lot more about this in talk number three. So a summary to the introduction here, or my introduction, is nitrogen emissions to the atmosphere is very important to many areas, 
Uh, it's driven very significant and shows very significant increases in ammonia. Those sources of ammonia to the atmosphere are primarily due to agriculture, specifically all of the components of agriculture, swine, beef cattle, dairy, and fertilizers. And that contributes about 80% of the ammonia going in the atmosphere. We're seeing more ammonia, both in wet deposition coming out of rainfall and dry deposition coming out just due to gravitational forces. And we're seeing air concentrations go up in almost all of the regions of the U.S. And it's having an effect on both on air quality by driving the particulate formation in the atmosphere and reduced visibility primarily out west, but that occurs in the east also. And we are beginning to predict and see forest and agriculture and water environment depositional changes to this view of things from a critical loads perspective. And it all ties back to agriculture because you're the primary source of ammonia. So agriculture certainly has an important role to play in these solutions through improved best management practices and control of nitrogen, particularly ammonia releases in some fashion or the other. And real quickly, with my last couple of minutes here, uh, the NEDP is a system of committees, and one of our committees is the Total Deposition Scientific Committee. And they are going to have an Ag Stakeholders webinar series coming up. Um, the webinar series is going to start on Wednesday, October 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, it's going to consist, the series is going to consist of three webinars that expand upon topics discussed in this webinar, and nitrogen and ammonia is going to be one of them. Uh, it'll be approximately an hour in a length and be every other month or two. You, everyone is certainly welcome to come to those. Webinar one, again, on the October 9th, that Wednesday, will be the impact of atmospheric nitrogen deposition, specifically on water quality. Uh, the first presentation will be mine where I review this uh, webinar that we're doing today. But correctly after me, presentation two will be given by Dr. Robert Sabo with the EPA's Office of R&D. Uh, he's been with the O&D since 2019, and he is going to talk about clean air, clean water, question uh, mark. That, does that necessarily follow? Uh, specifically impacts of the atmospheric nitrogen deposition on water. So if you're interested at all in either of those presentations or the webinar series, you'll find more information at the NAD website here or this specifically the website that belongs to our TDEP subcommittee.